Well, uh, well, first of all, I would like really like the other panelists to thank uh, the organizers uh, of this uh, symposium. Thank you, Lionel, for inviting me here, because yes, it's uh, true that there's actually many people here whose work I've read <laughs> and I had never met. So it's actually <laughs> great to be here. Um, so what is the link uh, between citizenship and Indian child welfare? Well, actually, I have already reflected on this question in uh, previous research, going back to my PhD. Um, on the evolution of the federal tribal uh, state triangulation in this sphere and kind of the different sources of government uh, responsibility towards Native American children, Native American children, but mainly I had went back to the 1940s and 1950s, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> name tag, uh, when the number of placements uh, by state institutions really uh, increased. Um, but this presentation was actually the opportunity to get back uh, further in time um, and to see, to reflect on the place maybe of the Indian Citizenship Act uh, in this um, evolving triangulation. So before reflecting on the way this, uh, the act impacted uh, Indian child welfare, I will just say a few things about child welfare in general and Indian child welfare and see how two systems actually already existed prior to 1922, uh, 24, sorry, and how wardship and citizenship already had to do uh, with these systems. Um, so in the realm of child welfare, so independently of the indigenous question, wardship has come to define the relationship between the public sphere and different uh, categories of children. Uh, in the Young Republic, it mainly applied to poor and or parentless children, those labeled orphans and destitute, who became wards of a governmental entity, which then acted as a guardian. Um, as the image and the concept of the child and childhood evolved throughout the 19th century, um, other categories emerged to describe uh, children in need of state intervention to help supplement or replace uh, birth parents. Indeed, the US society was moving away from a perception of children as miniature adults and uh, from the Protestant vision of children as inherently sinful, children became adults in the making who were in a state of dependency while growing up before reaching the age of majority. When birth parents were not considered as providing a safe environment, it became the responsibility of the state to intervene, either by helping the parents or by terminating uh, their parental rights and acting then as a surrogate parent. The emergence of the modern state as a parent was fundamental to uh, the Republic. Children were not only adults in the making, but also citizens in the making. So parents rated as unfit were thus in this way perceived as endangering the future of the Republic by hindering the ideal of individual emancipation, we say. They were not preparing good citizens and thus needed to be sanctioned by the state for the best interest of the nation uh, this time. So next to orphans and destitute children, and because of this evolution, another category of dependent children emerged in the second half of the 19th century, neglected and abused children, those who needed protection from their parents. Uh, while the expression best interest of the child started to be used by state courts to determine and justify state intervention in the lives of families. This expression found its origins in the legal doctrine of parents patriae, which was first used uh, in the United States by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in 1838 to describe the guardian ward relationship between the state and the child. All the children do indeed need state protection in certain cases. Expressions like child abuse and neglect or best interest of the child remain vague and unclear, leaving space uh, for ambivalence. Like any policy or institution which draws from concepts like protection, dependency or guardianship. Ambivalence around the power it gives to the party which acts as a protector. Uh, what norms are used to determine neglect, danger, etc. As Marilyn Irvin Holt says in her book, Indian Orphanages, the emergence of child welfare services in the United States led to more intervention in, and thus more control, of primarily poor and non-white families. So let us now just say a few things about the form uh, the mainstream child welfare apparatus took. It was clearly a prerogative of the states, so the apparatus relied exclusively on state institutions. It was still the case in 1924 when the Indian Citizenship Act was adopted. Although a decade before, the federal government had set up the Children's Bureau, so this federal agency which acted as kind of a expertise center, 
um, whose role was to come up with recommendations to orient state policies as they related to children. Yet the creation of the uh, Children Bureau had no impact on the state apparatus itself, the mechanism. Um, so statutory permission to intervene in families and laws which dealt with uh, child abuse and neglect developed at the state level. In every state, child welfare grew as a twofold system, relying both on judicial mechanisms through the emerging children's courts and on administrative uh, services, with different types of services uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, ranging from placement in institutions, orphanages, legal guardianship, which was at the time um, much more used than uh, adoption. Uh, Irvin Holt said, for example, that adoption only became a child welfare uh, service in the 1940s, not before. Um, foster care, of course, which slowly took precedence over orphanages uh, as it uh, recreated family life. And especially after the 1909 White House Conference on Dependent Children, um, the development of state and county aid to mothers with the idea that children had to be maintained uh, in their homes. So that's the mainstream system. And then next to these services, another child welfare system existed in the United States for Native American dependent children, which this time involved tribal and federal institutions. Following the special political and legal status of indigenous nations in the United States, Native American children were mainly apprehended by the federal government as minor members of domestic dependent nations. So originally, there was no direct relationship between the federal institutions and individual children. What does the word nation imply here as it pertains to child welfare? Well, we may say that child welfare does not only um, can, can be defined differently. It's not only the judicial and administrative apparatus of the modern state. Um, it's kind of a limited definition. We may say it more broadly, it simply refers to the manner in which all human societies organize to ensure the safety of children according to their own uh, norms. So we can say that when it relates to Native Americans, it pertains to tribal domestic law and tribal internal uh, sovereignty. In theory, the right of indigenous nations to organize for the welfare of their children has never been statutorily limited by Congress. Yet, throughout the 19th century, conflicts, forced displacements, diseases, federal assimilationist policies on reservations have indeed seriously harmed the ability of indigenous institutions to care for and retain control over their children by exploding the basis of political and social structure, uh, kinship ties. As Vine Deloria uh, Jr. and Clifford Little explain in American Indian uh, American Justice, in most indigenous cultures, I quote, domestic laws such as marriage, divorce, child adoption, social welfare, or well handled through clan and family, with the emphasis on responsibility rather than rights. End quote. So kinship obligations built safety nets, ensuring that children will sell them without uh, relatives. According to Irvin Holt again, um, and I quote, an extraordinary set of circumstances rendered a child kinless and a child without any protection was largely an anomaly. Yet, assimilationist policies and reservation life changed the situation by reducing kinship networks to nuclear families and severing kinship ties. Compulsory education and the development of off-reservation boarding schools surely were fundamental in this process, but other policies participated into this. Allotment, for instance, as Deloria and Little uh, further say, quite often, and I quote, in order to break the links with relatives, families would be given allotments in widely separate places on the reservation. Grandparents might be given lands 40, 50 miles away from their children. Young people just establishing a family might have their allotments deliberately selected miles from where the majority of their uh, relatives lived. Some agents gloated that they had devised a way to stop the perpetual visiting that characterized Indian life at the time." End quote. So in this context, tribal institutions were progressively estranged from control over their children, and tribal internal sovereignty was de facto eroded as the federal government built a direct relationship this time with Native American children. And this leads us to the adjective dependent in the expression domestic dependent nations. Indeed, 
Dependent indigenous children were then apprehended by the federal government as minor members of political entities which were themselves collectively treated as wards. So there was a twofold dependency for dependent indigenous children as ward children and as ward Indians, to use the expression that was used then. So this double dependency was then fundamental in shaping federal policies and services towards indigenous children. And the latter became kind of a privileged category to accelerate the transition from Indian wardship to citizenship. In keeping with these efforts, dependent children actually did not really receive special treatment. All Native American children were apprehended by the federal government as necessitating the intervention of the federal government to protect them against the negative influence of tribal institutions and tribal life. So in this analogy between the status of children and the status of indigenous nations, which actually Toby Rollo has even defined as a homology, <laughs> the ambivalence between protection and power is still at play. Um, as Vine Deloria again and David Wilkins stipulate in the legal universe, and I quote, the expression best interest of the child, not unlike the doctrine of plenary power as applied to Indian tribes, is indeterminate and is jurisprudentially unsound. Judges, justices, federal lawmakers have vast discretionary power to define what the best interests uh, are." End quote. Moreover, children's interests and Native Americans' interests are always conceptualized by their guardian as prospective and in a way justifying violence in the present. Um, wardship is a temporary period of constraint before emancipation. Yet isn't this transient aspect of wardship violating the right of indigenous institutions to carry on existing as distinct political entities, thus as nations within the United Na uh, States? Sorry. Um, isn't wardship then turning rights into interests? Something that can also be said about the status of children, as Deloria and Wilkins further suggest when they say that, quote, US law and society tend to speak of children's interests rather than rights. Thus, their needs and desires are oftentimes trumped or sumsumed by the state's rights or parental rights. So if the collective status of tribes as wards played an important role in the shaping of a specific mechanism for uh, dependent indigenous children at the turn of the 20th century, the individual status of adults is also to take uh, into consideration. Indeed, wardship was also applied to individuals in that period, following the federal allotment policy and the setting up of tribal roles. Individuals were thus classified as wards or non-wards according to different criteria that we mentioned, such as block quantum, competence, especially of the Burke Act of 1906, or the maintaining of tribal links. Individual wardship placed trust restrictions on personal autonomy and the handling of one's allotment, while automatic assumption of citizenship after the conclusion of a 25 year period was established. Although as we saw yesterday, it's much more complex than that. So this logic of gradual individual access to citizenship, not according to consent anymore, but to one's status as ward, non-ward, also had repercussions on how dependent Native American children were taken care of. Ward parents, relatives, had less control over their children, while some children following the emancipated status of their parents started to be considered by the federal government as falling under the responsibility of the states. So um, let us say, for example, a few words, yes, about the, the case of orphans, which is kind of interesting here. The Dawes Act of 18, uh, 1887 established that each orphan child of less than 18 years old was entitled to one eighth of a section, which if I'm not mistaken, represents like 80 acres, something like that. Another element specified by the federal legislation was that the agents acting as guardians were responsible for the selection of the allotments. Although the law seems straightforward, the definition of an orphan is not that simple. Here, BIA archival documents of the early 20th century, for example, show that some local agents were not sure about what constituted an orphan in a Native American context. Was the death of parents within the nuclear family enough to consider a child as an orphan, even if the child was indeed, uh, even, um, does that mean that the child was actually kinless? So is it kinless or parentless? <laughs> and there is exchanges between agents and higher levels in the, in the BIA about that. Um, 
And these are important questions since orphans were also placed under the protection of a legal guardian who could act in lieu of the child in matters pertaining to their allotment in relation to uh, individual Indian money accounts, for instance. It goes without saying that legal guardianship was not placed in the hands of adults who were themselves wards, so it was excluding a lot of people. Some agents even complained that many legal guardians, almost exclusively non-Indigenous people, were more interested in the money they could divert from children's accounts uh, than by the best interests of these children. The same could be told about financial assistance to parents, which, as we said earlier, developed in the mainstream system, um, child, in the mainstream child welfare system at the time. Within the BIA, discussions existed on the relevance of using that money for parents otherwise rated as incompetent to help them raising their children, while the overall policy of the federal government was to sever the ties between the child and the tribe. So at the turn of the 1920s, only non-wards could then fully ex yeah, exercise their uh, role as parents. Uh, but then, when uh, they reached citizenship, the status of the child and of the responsible institutions was not clear at all. Did non-wards fall under the responsibility of the state? If so, does it mean that granting citizenship to all Native Americans would imply the end of special child welfare mechanisms for indigenous children and more involvement of the states in a domain which they were traditionally excluded from. So let us now turn to the Indian uh, Citizenship Act. Um, as already explained by other uh, panelists yesterday, the extension of citizenship to all Native Americans in 1924 did not put an end to wardship. So both relationships to the federal government were not perceived as incompatible, creating a system of dual relationship. In 1936, the Interior Solicitor explained that federal guardianship still existed for two categories of uh, Native American people, those who uh, hold trust property and those who maintain tribal relations. Wardship for the second category was justified because, I quote, and this was in 1936, the federal government is morally bound to advance their civilization and ability to self-government. So federal trust obligations were still 10 years after the 1924 law explained as a civilizing mission. And clearly those parents and relatives who retained the status of ward carried on being more readily judged as less fit to raise their children according to not dominant norms. Uh, as not being able to fully exercise their parental role. Altogether, the ability of indigenous institutions to care for and retain control over their dependent children continued to be threatened in the decades following the 1924 federal legislation. Right? If access to citizenship did not mean less federal control, conversely, it led to more state control and state intervention in the lives of Native American families. Because after 1924, citizenship starting to be used by the federal administration as the privileged source of responsibility towards those children, thus shifting the place of the federal actor. Indeed, the latter plays a fundamental part when acting as guardian honoring trust responsibilities to the exclusion of states, yet, as we saw at the beginning of this presentation, it only holds a secondary role in the mainstream child welfare system. So by insisting on citizenship as the root of public responsibility for the care of indigenous dependent children, the BIA could now push for more alignment with the mainstream system and thus more state intervention. Four years after the adoption of the Indian Citizenship Act, the Merriam Report encouraged such evolution. It criticized the federal administration in charge of Indian affairs for the use of boarding schools as a child welfare service. And instead, it recommended training and hiring welfare workers and turning towards state resources, including foster care uh, services. So the transition towards state intervention began at the turn of the 1930s, when the BIA set in motion the closure of different boarding schools. For example, in 1932, a plan for closing the Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School in Michigan was initiated by the federal administration. It was established that most of the children who were enrolled remained in the school for social reasons and that they could not go back safely to their home. It would thus be best for them to be placed in foster homes through state services. As the BIA social worker who was in charge of that transition later explained, 
Her role was then, and I quote, to coordinate services during the transition period and ensure that services were being accepted and assumed by state and county agencies. A con end quote, sorry. A contract agreement was reached in 1934, which involved the BIA, the state, and the Michigan Children's Aid Society, and which led, I quote, to the termination of BIA social services in that area, end quote, and the placement in foster homes of 116 children. The example of the children of Mount Pleasant raises many questions that will keep on coming up in the following decades as the BIA closed more schools and pushed for more integration of Native American children into the state uh, child welfare systems. Where are the children really in danger in, if they return to, uh, on their reservation? Uh, where a customary uh, kinship obligation not enough or maybe not formalized uh, enough? Um, because some were actually through um, the emerging tribal courts. But then another question is, were the decisions of the tribal court given any credit? Another question, what norms and forums were used to place these children? Um, if they are actually decision of state courts, um, the latter have normally do no jurisdiction on reservations. What licensing criteria for the foster homes? Did Native American families meet state criteria to become foster homes? So on the topic of foster care, it is interesting to look at the principles that actually the BIA social worker that I talked about, who was in charge of the transition, established. Um, she believed those um, principles should, and I quote her, govern methods of welfare work with Indian people in the future, so by the state. She says, for example, I quote, we need to proceed carefully and slowly when we consider separating an Indian child from his own family or relatives. Though living standards may be low and diet inadequate, we should have in mind that there is no real substitute for a child's uh, own home. Reminds us even of 1978 here. <laughs> she even says, um, to make a wider use of the Indian home when dependent and neglected children are placed in boarding care and to make, I quote, more use of qualified and high type Indian people as consultants in locating good Indian homes. So there's still the competent, not competent. But yet there is something, right, and despite uh, these suggestions, nearly all of the 116 children I talked about uh, ended up in the homes of white people. She explains that with a quote, it was necessary since Indian population centers, the reservations, do not happen to be in the vicinity of the branch offices of the Michigan Children's Aid Society, rendering service delivery uh, more complex. So such a practical or contingent reason seems to suffice here, uh, totally silencing the question of the legal and political ties of the children with the federal government and with their tribe. Um, Another question, what authority does the state have in placing these children? A couple of years after Mount Pleasant, the same process uh, started to take place at the Toma School for Indians in Wisconsin, where actually many Ho-Chunk uh, children were enrolled. The question of state authority to place Ho-Chunk children was asked during a 1937 State Advisory Committee meeting on Indian child welfare. <laughs> the answer is quite telling here, and I quote, the conclusion arrived at was that the parents of the children had given their consent to the Toma placement, and due to the present circumstance, the foster homes served as a substitute for Toma. As simple as that. So the decision relies on implied consent of the parents, while tribal consent, again, is not even mentioned at all, although many of these children actually originally resided on uh, the reservation and thus should primarily fall under tribal authority. Furthermore, he testifies to the fact that such transfer of authority was dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, often through administrative decisions, without any sanction by the US Congress. State law also had to be modified to facilitate uh, this process. Uh, as uh, David Wilkins and uh, Kate Sianina Lomawaima explain in Uneven Ground, and I quote, Many states had clauses in their organic acts and constitutions disclaiming jurisdiction over Indian property and persons forever, end quote. So different methods started to be adopted in the late 1920s. For instance, California adopted a special enabling act as early as 1927 to be able to enter into contracts with the BIA for services to Indians on reservations. 
In a memorandum to the Secretary of the Interior, Harold Hicks, dated um, January 1936, Commissioner of Indian Affairs John Collier adds that, and I quote, the Solicitor of the Interior has, since 1927, ruled that for a state where no enabling act has been passed, a ruling by the Attorney General of the state that the state had legal authority to enter into such a contract is sufficient authority. As the quote suggests, such dubious decision could even be taken in retrospect, after the contract was signed. Thus, building a fragile legal framework for state intervention and for making sure that both tribal internal sovereignty and federal trust obligations were respected in the process. So little by little, the mainstream child welfare system started, started to take precedence in shaping uh, services for uh, Native American dependent children, constituting, without any clear statute, statute sorry, a legal and administrative maze. If I go back to uh, my title, which um, talked about um, how the Indian Citizenship Act reshaped <laughs> the U.S. Indian child welfare, I was like, well, it may be a bit too much to say that it actually, the, the 1924 law uh, reshaped. But um, yes, um, 1934, according to me, well, this may be more of a turning point with the Social Security Act on the one hand and the um, Johnson O'Malley Act on the other hand. Uh, but still, um, the 1924 law was the initial stone, in a way. It opened the way by enabling the BIA to rely primarily on citizenship as the prime source of public responsibility in the sphere of Indian child welfare, thus leading to that legal maze uh, at the crossroad between the two legal orders in which the two pre-existing child welfare systems uh, rested. At the time, this maze always disfavored tribal institutions, which kept on being excluded from the decision affecting their children, leading to a massive removal of indigenous uh, children by state institutions in the following decades, until the intervention of the federal government in 1978 with the Indian Child Welfare Act. And it's interesting to end here, given the conversation that we had yesterday, uh, that in the preamble of the act, of the 1978 act this time, Congress insists on its exclusive and plenary power in Indian affairs. Yet here, it is a power that is used to protect tribes and tribal members against state authority. Um, so intruding on state prerogatives in a way. And that power of Congress was uh, in the realm of child welfare was confirmed in 2022 with the Holland uh, versus Bracken. So I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.